Hello, I'm Hannah Dodd with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Che Partnership Webinar, which is titled Health Effects and Sources of Melamine Exposure. Our moderator today is Karen Wang, Director of the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. We will leave time following the presentations for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions to the Q&A feature available on the main menu bar at the top of your win window at any point during the presentation. After the presentations, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who have called in on the phone, I, we have posted today's slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you all for being here today to hear about the health effects and sources of melamine exposure. As a mom of two young kids, I see melamine everywhere. It's found a lot in children's products and in reusable foodware. Now, if you're wondering what is melamine, then you're in the right place. Um, today, we will hear from four scientists who will give us an overview on the science of melamine and also discuss the health impacts, especially in children. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Jane Monk, who is the managing director of Food Packaging Forum, a charitable foundation that she set up in 2012 in Zurich, Switzerland. Jane holds a PhD in ecotoxology and a uh, master's in environmental science from ETH Zurich. She specializes in science communication about chemicals in all types of food contact materials and articles and their impacts on human health in the environment. Um, Dr. Monk is actively publishing research on this topic and publicly speaks about the chemical challenges in general and food packaging's impacts in particular. Since 2019, she's an elected member of the BioSwiss Committee on Trade and Processing, as well as a full scientific member of the Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, the American Chemi Chemical Society, the Science for Tox Toxicology, and the Endocrine Society. Our second speaker today is Dr. Karun Thachalam Kanan, who is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Division of Environmental Pediatrics at NYU, School of Medicine. He has published over 780 research articles, um, 25 book chapters, and co-edited a book. He is known for his work on the discovery of perfluorochemicals in the global environment, among several others. Currently, his research is focused on biomonitoring of human exposure to organic pollutants. He is one of the top leaders in the field of human biomonitoring, and his lab is well-funded by the U.S. federal government agencies such as NIH. He has won several medals, international awards, and honors throughout his career. Most recently, he has been awarded by New York State Department of Health's Sturman Award for Excellence in Research. Our third speaker today is Dr. Sheila Sathyana Rayana, who is a professor of pediatrics and adjunct professor within the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington and the Seattle Children's Research Institute. Her research interests focus on exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals and their impact on perinatal and child health. Dr. Seth Yanarayana serves as the PI for the Infant Development and Environment Study. She is a co-principal investigator for the NIH Environmental Factors Affecting Child Health Outcomes Pathways Study at the University of Washington and the Seattle Children's Research Institute. She currently serves on the US EPA Scientific Advisory Committee on Chemicals for the Toxic Substances Control Act. She also practices medicine at the University of Washington Medical Center as medical director of the newborn nursery. And our last speaker today is Dr. Drew Day, who is a trained toxicologist and epidemiologist within Dr. Sathyana Rayana's lab at the Seattle Children's Research Institute Center for Child Health, Behavior and Development. He serves as a principal investigator on a NIH 
um, environmental factors affecting child health outcomes, opportunities and infrastructure fund grant, Investi investigating patterns of co-occurrence for pediatric health outcomes related to neurodevelopment, airway development, and obesity. Dr. Day's research has included examining links between maternal estrogen and testosterone or mixtures of phthalate plasticizer chemicals during pregnancy and child behavior between prenatal gene transcription in the placenta and child behavior and between child, childhood melamine and kidney health. I think it's safe to say that we have four very accomplished um, speakers and um, we are very excited to hear from them um, and you know, hear their presentations and have them answer your questions. So with that, Dr. Monk, I will hand it over to you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, very much, Karen, for the kind introduction and hello to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be participating in this webinar today and also a, a very big honor. Um, I want to also acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Birgit Goyke here from the Food Packaging Forum, who also contributed to preparing the slides for my talk today and whose work actually will also feature during the talk. Okay, so let's start by taking a look at melamine. What is it actually? Melamine is a synthetic chemical that was first made by German chemist Justus von Liebig in 1834. It's a so-called organic chemical that was then subsequently used in the manufacture of novel synthetic chemical products like plastic resins. And here you can see the structure of melamine. It contains six nitrogen atoms per molecule. So keep that in mind and we'll look at this in a little bit um, in a moment. Today, melamine is a high production volume chemical and its production volume uh, in the US alone is around 64 million metric tons, which uh, corresponds roughly to 16,000 elephants or 16,000 hammers if you're more into cars. Um, some of this is exported, some of it is imported, but it's, it's a very big number. So what are the main uses of melamine today? So most of melamine is used to polymerize with form aldehyde to make melamine form aldehyde resins, which essentially are then made into plastic products. And these resins are then used, for example, as laminates for flooring, but also for reusable plastic tableware, for bamboo plastics, for coatings, adhesives, and for composites like plywood. The global melamine form aldehyde resin market is huge with a total market volume worldwide in 2019 of 21 billion US dollars. And you can see that laminates for flooring are a huge part of the market, but also adhesives, paints and coatings, tableware, of course, and also electrical and household appliances play a role. So we see that the uses of melamine form aldehyde resin are quite diverse, but Melamine also has other uses, and it can also be used alone uh, as yellow pigment in plastics. And there are also products made of melamine foam, for example, used in cleaning products. So these are those soft white sponges. Maybe you've seen them that dissolve in water and you can use them for cleaning white walls and sneakers and so on. Uh, and this foamed type of melamine is also used in building materials. Then melamine on its own can be an additive with fire retardant properties in plastics or paper. And interestingly, it's also a metabolite, a so-called breakdown product of the pesticide cyramazine. And last but not least, it's probably most known for being a non-protein nitrogen that was used in several food adulteration cases to increase the parent protein content. And this is also one of the reasons why there is much concern about melamine. So let's take a closer look at this. So in 2008, 10 thousands of children in China were poisoned due to infant formula adulteration with melamine. Why was melamine added to infant formula? Well, because when you measure protein content, um, these are based on measuring nitrogen and nitrogen is a key part of proteins as you can see here in this protein structure. So basically high nitrogen content is approximated with high protein content. But as I showed you before, melamine also has high nitrogen content. And so in order to sell 
low quality milk that seemed like it was rich in protein content. The infant formula in China was deliberately mixed with the cheap man-made chemical melamine, but melamine is toxic. And so 10,000s of infants got very ill and several children actually died because of this. It, it was, frankly, it was a terrible, terrible tragedy and completely unnecessary. Similarly, melamine has also been used in a criminal way to increase the parent protein content in pet food. And this led to tragic deaths and illnesses of many, many pets in the United States uh, about 15 years ago. Again, a terrible and avoidable tragedy. So what are the hazards then of melamine? So it's known to cause acute kidney toxicity as was seen in the case of the Chinese infants. And uh, it's especially detrimental if there is cyanuric acid present too in combination with melamine. But it also has chronic toxicity properties and it's suspected of damaging fertility in the unborn child and Importantly, it's also been rated as being possibly carcinogenic by the World Health Organization, so as being an IRAC Group 2B chemical. And the European Chemicals Agency has included it as suspected carcinogen and therefore Category 2 under the EU CLP regulation. Other effects that have been reported are neurotoxicity and adverse impacts on the gut microbiome. And further, there's also toxicity for the environment, namely melamine being a suspected persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substance, and also a persistent mobile and toxic substance, so spreading through uh, the waterways. And you can find all the references for the hazard profiles um, here. And we'll hear much more about the uh, toxicity from, from Dr. Sheila and Dr. Drew in a moment. So right now, let's focus on food contact articles and whether they are a relevant source of melamine. And to get us started, I'd like to first clarify some of the key terms that we use when we talk about food contact materials and articles. So the food contact articles are the finished food packaging or food tableware products like a cup of yogurt here or in our case here, um, a printed kids plate made of melamine formaldehyde resin. The food contact articles consist of one or several food contact materials. So for example, in the case of melamine, uh, of this melamine plate, it would be the plastic, the resin, and the printing ink. And then of course, all food contact materials and articles are made up of chemicals, which we uh, call the food contact chemicals. So these are either chemicals that are intentionally used to make a food contact material like melamine and formaldehyde, but Food contact chemicals also includes chemicals that are non-intentionally added substances or NIAS, um, which are impurities, reaction byproducts or degradation products, and which are present in the finished article regardless of whether they have a function or not. Important here is that all food contact chemicals may be relevant for human exposure since they could transfer into food. And this process of uh, food contact chemicals transferring from, for example, a plastic plate or bottle in this example into food is known as migration. So here you see a plastic bottle that contains food contact chemicals. And these small chemicals, the small molecules are the red dots here. And under certain conditions, these small food contact chemicals can get into the food and even chemicals on the outside of the bottle, like an adhesive or in a printing ink, can get through the bottle and end up in the food if the bottle doesn't have good barrier properties. But not all chemicals migrate the same and there are a few principles for when you will get higher migration. So let's look at what influences migration of chemicals into food. First of all, high temperatures lead to higher migration. Then after long contact or long storage times, you will get higher migration as well. Third, if you have fatty foods, for example, you'll get higher migration of fat soluble chemicals. And last, when you use small portion sizes, you get proportionally higher migration per volume of food than when you have bulk size packaging. So now you may be wondering how and how often is melamine measured in, in food contact articles. So um, let's take a look at how it's measured. So basically you have two options for determining this experimentally. First, you can do a migration experiment. 
here you don't measure melamine directly in your cup or your plate, but instead you put some food into the container, or you may even use a so-called food simulant, which essentially is a solvent that best simulates the chemistry of food, but it's not a food. Food simulants are useful because analyzing chemicals in them is so much easier than analyzing chemicals in most foods because foods are very complex chemically and it's quite challenging to measure chemicals directly in food. Important here is that regardless of whether you measure in food or in food simulant, if you want to know that the origin of the melamine uh, is indeed the food contact article, you need to have a, a specific study design. So this means you need to somehow prove that the melamine is indeed coming out of the cup or whatever it is that you have in your food in. So um, you need to measure at a few different time points, for example, to prove this. If you then see an increase over time, it's clear that you are measuring migration indeed. The other way to measure if a chemical is present in a food contact article is to do an extraction experiment. And for this, organic solvents are used, which are not considered to be similar to food, so they're quite aggressive. Um, or you could also dissolve your material and then extract the chemical of interest. Importantly, the migration experiment is considered the real, worth, uh, real world case, while the extraction experiment will tell you if a chemical is present in a food contact article. But this type of experiment won't tell you if this chemical would actually migrate under normal conditions of use. Okay, so that's important when we're looking at food contact articles as human exposure source to melamine. If you measure it in food, it may have other sources than the food contact article, so you need to design your experiments differently if you want to know about migration or presence in foodware. But how many studies are there actually on the migration or extraction from food contact articles? So this graph is based on a systematic review that we've been doing here at FPF, and that's been led by my colleague, Dr. Birgit Goyke. And we've not published these data yet, but we will uh, shortly. And here you can see that before 2004, when the first cases of pet food adulteration happened with melamine, there were no measurements of melamine in food contact articles. Studies started in 2005, and they've been increasing over the last few years, but in total, we, we could find only 26 published studies so far, publicly available, um, that are looking at the migration or extraction of melamine from food contact. So not a huge amount. So to summarize our findings, melamine and formaldehyde are the most frequently found migrants from melamine formaldehyde resin. And melamine is usually not detected in migrates or extracts of other types of plastics like polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, but it is detected in coatings of metal cans. So they are a source of melamine. In 2012, untargeted migration studies uh, from bamboo melamine table were showed dozens of food contact chemicals to migrate into food simulants. So not only melamine that migrates from this type of material. And um, melamine degradation products could be extracted uh, from food packaging, including amylene, amylide, um, and cyanuric acid. And maybe Dr. Cannon will speak more about this work today. It's his study. And UV sterilization of kitchenware made of melamine form aldehyde resin increased migration of plastic additives and of the NIAS, the non-intentionally added substances. But importantly, the repeated use of melamine form aldehyde tableware with hot foods leads to increasing migration of melamine and also of formaldehyde. So there are some studies showing that melamine is present in food contact articles but what about the levels of concentration of melamine that migrate? Do they exceed levels that are considered safe? So the level that is currently considered safe in Europe and also in the US is 2.5 milligram melamine per kilogram of food. And the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, says that this is the appropriate level to distinguish between the unavoidable background presence of melamine from food contact materials or from pesticide use and unacceptable criminal adulteration. And 
uh, FDA has the same acceptable level of melamine in food with the exception of infant formula, where to my knowledge, maybe someone knows better, um, no safe level has actually been set for this food type. The current tolerable daily intake as set by the European Food Safety Authority and also by WHO is 2.5 milligram per kilogram body weight. And notably, this was lowered in 2010 after the milk scandal. And it's important also to note here that the current specific migration limit for melamine is five times lower than it could be based on the TDI if food exposure were considered the only source of melamine. But food exposure is not the only source of melamine, and therefore the limit in food is lower um, as other exposure sources have to be considered. And finally, um, some migration data that are already quite old um, from Emma Bradley and her colleagues in the UK. They measured migration of melamine form aldehyde tableware using 3% acetic acid during two hours and at 70 degrees Celsius. And they found quite a range of melamine migration with actually many of the samples being non-compliant with today's limits. But importantly, migration into distilled water did not happen. And also some more recent data from um, Provaridom et al. shows that microwave heating has a different effect on melamine tableware than just thermal heat in that it leads to a more rapid degradation and increased migration uh, in this reusable tableware after only about 40 times used for one minute per time in the microwave. So uh, they did a very nice job of explaining that microwaves destroy the polymer matrix by a special mechanism. And as a conclusion, these uh, scientists from Thailand actually strongly recommend not to microwave melamine tableware. So to summarize, um, what's known about migration of melamine from melamine form aldehyde plastic tableware. Uh, the 3% acetic acid food simulant leads to higher migration than migration into water. And acetic acid is considered a good food simulant for acidic beverages like juices, fruit tea, and sodas, including Coke, consumed at room temperature or cold temperatures. Uh, lower migration of melamine was found into olive oil, which does make sense because melamine is more water soluble than fat soluble. That's why it's a mobile chemical. High temperatures lead to increased migration rates because the polymer degrades. So over time, migration of melamine increases from the reusable tableware and the plastic gets brittle. And, and that's really not good um, if you're reusing this uh, tableware. And microwave heating leads to very high levels of migration despite short contact times uh, because the material is degraded by the microwaves. So these are the facts, but what do the authorities actually recommend? In 2017, FDA published this guidance on their website stating that when highly acidic foods are heated to extreme temperatures, like 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly 70 degrees Celsius, so not so extreme actually, the amount of melamine that migrates out of the plastic can increase. Foods and drinks should not be heated on melamine-based dinnerware in microwave ovens. And in Europe, the German BFR, the Federal Institute for Risk Assessment in Germany, stated that infants who often consume hot food or drinks from this type of tableware were found to potentially absorb tolerable daily intake TDI for melamine up to three times of the TDI. And the BFR concluded that there was a possible increase in health risk for consumers drinking hot liquid foods from melamine type tableware. So these are two very similar approaches by these authorities and both agencies are clearly concerned about this material, but nevertheless, melamine uh, tableware is still allowed on the market, and I'm concerned that people who don't inform themselves uh, properly, they don't realize that there are these concerns and limitations for use, and that melamine should not be used with hot food at all, and probably also not for acidic food. So I think there's, there's still a lot of awareness raising to be done to better protect the public. And to conclude, I'd like to summarize briefly, melamine is a widely used man-made synthetic chemical. Melamine is also a chemical of concern, and there's 
uh, in fact, increasing concern about its human toxicity and its persistence and mobility in the aquatic environment. Migration from food content materials has been detected and often actually exceeds uh, current safe levels. Authorities recommend that melamine tableware should not be used for contact with hot foods. And I would also add it shouldn't be used for contact with acidic foods at room temperature. And ideally, uh, probably you won't use it at all and instead use inert reusable containers made of stainless steel or glass or ceramics. And finally, important to note here is that other sources of melamine than food contact may be significant, such as building materials, these cleaning products, and also pesticides and others. So this chemical is truly everywhere, and it's certainly difficult to avoid. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions afterwards. And thanks also a lot to the Food Packaging Forum team. Uh, we've got a ton of free resources on our website, so go check those out if you are interested, thanks. Thank you so much, Jane, for this wonderful presentation. While we are waiting for Dr. Kanan to pull up his slides, I just remind you, you can put in questions in the Q&A feature and we'll get to that at the end of all four, three of our presentations. Can you all see my slides? Yes, we can see them great, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, hello everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to talk about sources and pathways of human exposure to melamine. So we have done some studies over the past four or five years looking at uh, different sources that contribute to human exposure. As Jane indicated, uh, food contact materials, especially uh, Dinnerware is one of the important sources of human exposure. Besides uh, the food contact materials, there are so many other different sources that we were interested in looking at to, to uh, find out about what are the major sources of exposure. If we know the sources and pathways, at least we can do something to reduce our exposure. So I'm going to talk about melamine and uh, its derivatives, amylin, amylate, and cyanuric acid. Not much is known about the other three derivatives, but uh, they are also important because they're used in many different products that we come in contact with. Uh, and they're all, if, if you look at the structure, they're very closely related to each other. Uh, melamine can be metabolized to cyanuric acid or amylin and amylate, you know, depending upon uh, the condition. As Jen indicated, in 2007, so in 2007 and 2008, there were um, uh, accidents related to um, pet food contamination by melamine, as well as toxic food, uh, toxic milk powder scandal in China that resulted in deaths of uh, a lot of pets, uh, as well as uh, infants in China and several hundred thousands were affected because of that exposure. But th this, this was a result of deliberate introduction of melamine into the food stuff. So we were interested in knowing what are the other sources? You know, if uh, melamine is not introduced deliberately, there are also other sources because melamine is widely used and eat those sources that contribute to exposure. So as uh, Jane mentioned, melamine and cyanuric acid are uh, very high production volume chemicals. Millions of tons are produced every year uh, for their use in a wide range of products, including laminates, uh, adhesives. They're also used in textiles as uh, fireproofing agents, also wrinkle-free, uh, crease-proof compounds. They are coated on some of the textiles as well. Um, they, they are... Uh, Scratch resistant, impact resistant, and heat resistant. These are some of the properties make them to be used in some applications. Uh, as I told you, they are also used as flame retardants in polyurethane foam type of materials, paints, and some apparel like firefighters, uh, uh, you know, the fireproof wear contain melamine as well. Uh, used in textiles, some um, types of melamine, uh, cyanuric acid, are also used as fertilizers in agriculture because they can a lot of nitrogen, uh, 
and they can form a slow release nitrogen containing fertilizer. So they're used in agriculture to some extent. In fact, we have done a study looking at different types of nitrogen containing fertilizers and melamine is present in many of the nitrogen containing fertilizers. So if those fertilizers are applied in the farm, that can be a source of melamine to, you know, the produce um, grown in the farms, dairy cow, uh, you know, dairy cattle, all those kinds of things can get exposed to melamine. Cyanuric acid is mostly used as, used as in disinfectants and bleaches, and also as a chlorine stabilizer in swimming pools. So if somebody is swimming, they are definitely exposed to cyanuric acid in large amounts. Uh, Non-protein nitrogen additive in animal feed, it is allowed in some countries uh, to mix cyanuric acid as a non-protein nitrogen source in animal feed, including uh, fish feed in aquaculture areas. Uh, cyanuric acid is also used as a flame retardant, and there are studies that show that uh, cyanuric acid is present in ha some air conditioning, air condi conditioning formulations. So there is no human biomonitoring studies looking at melamine exposure in human populations. Um, at least uh, CDC, the, the Enhance program doesn't have uh, melamine listed as one of their target compounds. We were interested in looking at melamine exposure in human population. So in 2018, we, uh, we started working on uh, developing a method to measure melamine in um, of course, we started with pet animals because obviously in 2007, um, pet food contamination, there is an interest in exposure of pets to uh, melamine and cyanuric acid. During that time, we developed a method and that method was later applied to human studies. And we also helped uh, Sheila to conduct some studies in 2018 to measure uh, melamine and cyanuric acid in uh, samples of children uh, from um, Washington State. So what we found in uh, human studies as well as in pet um, uh, urine samples collected in 2017 and 2018. So melamine is present widely, more than 99% of our samples, urine samples contained melamine. Uh, the human urine, it was from 19 individuals, but 213 samples were analyzed at the time for humans. Uh, the median concentration is 1.6 nanogram per milliliter. Cats had much higher concentration, 15 nanogram per milliliter. Between melamine and cyanuric acid, cyanuric acid concentrations were always five to 10 times higher in urine samples. It's probably because melamine is converted to cyanuric acid through metabolism or cyanuric acid itself is, is used in some products that contribute to exposure. Amylin and amylase, the other breakdown products of melamine are also present, but at a lower frequency, less than 60% of the samples contained amylin and amylase at much lower concentration. If you look at the concentration range, human samples, you know, the concentrations in, in those samples we analyzed uh, ranged between 3.5 to 190 nanograms per milliliter. This is for the total melamine and its derivatives. So we summed the melamine, cyanuric acid, amylase, and amylase to give this value of between 3.5 to 100, 190 nanogram per milliliter. But in, in a study of children that we did for Sheila, the concentrations were much higher, in fact. So the children are at least five times more highly exposed than adults you know, based on some of the data that we have. The concentrations in dogs and cats range from, urine concentrations range from 13 to 510, 5.8 to 760 nanograms per milliliter. What does this mean? So we want to put these results in the context of a reference value, right? So in Taiwan, there are lots of human occupational exposure studies because Taiwan, I think, is one of the major producers of melamine. There are many um, occupational exposure related studies in Taiwan. And one of the studies published in 2009 reported a reference value. Uh, this is the value that indicates a point source of exposure. So if the melamine concentration in urine is 63 microgram per gram creatinine on a creatinine corrected basis, then it, it is a, there is a point source of exposure. 
So the 63 micrograms per gram creatinine corresponds approximately to 30, 31.5 nanogram per milliliter urine. And our values in, in adult population is from below deduction limit to 57 nanogram per milliliter, which means that some individuals are very highly exposed than the others. So that study was also to look at daily variability in exposure. So what we did, we had 19 individuals give urine samples every day consecutively for 45 days. And we measured melamine, cyanuric acid, amylin, and amylase. And we calculated what is called as ICC, intra-class correlation coefficient. So if ICC value is greater than 0.75, that, that means that if you take one sample, that would predict the exposure of that individual for a prior time very well. It's an excellent uh, in the, um, uh, predictability of, of one sample to assess melamine exposure. If the ICC value is between 0.6 and 0.74, good predictability, which means you can take one sample and say that, you know, that for a, for a period of time, the exposure that you predicted is predictable, kind of, you know, with, with ICC value. So what we found was that the interday variability um, between different days, but with the same person, the ICC values were good, which means within an individual, you can predict the uh, exposure over time. If you take one sample today, you can predict my exposure probably you know, over a period of 45 days. That's what it means. Whereas between individuals, between those 19 individuals we studied, the predictability is very low, which is because obviously everybody is exposed to different levels. So the inter-individual variability is very high. Some are very highly exposed and some are not. And when you correct the urinary concentration to creatinine, then the predictability improves further. It, it, the improved predictability is much better. So for epidemiological studies, this data is very useful uh, to show that melamine concentrations are predictable, even if you take one measurement, and if you adjust the concentration to uh, creatinine, you can predict the exposure for a period of time. That's what we found in the study. And what are the factors that affect exposure? We found a significant uh, correlation between melamine and cyanuric acid in urine, but the correlation was very weak. So which means that their uh, exposures are related. You know that melamine gets converted into cyanuric acid and therefore the sources are the same, but cyanuric acid itself as its own source that's why you know some of the correlation, the power of the correlation is weak, but there is a significant correlation. Gender, they didn't affect exposure between males and females. We didn't see a big difference. Ethnicity, Asians or uh, Caucasians, African Americans, we didn't see a big difference. BMI was not a factor in determining the melamine or cyanuric acid concentration. But I have to say that our sample size is small. It's not a population-based study involving thousands of samples. Urinary concentrations of melamine were not correlated with creatinine in that particular study of 213 samples we analyzed. Then based on the urine concentration, we can predict the daily exposure dose, right? Because if you are excreting 100% of the melamine you are ingesting into urine, and if you know the urine concentration and the volume of urine you excrete every day, it is possible to calculate the intake rate. Okay. So we calculated that to be for melamine between, so it's, it's for 19 individuals. So you can see this, uh, uh, you know, the panel with 19 individuals. You can see the, the each uh, circle represents uh, each sample from that individual. So it's kind of variable. Um, but as I told you before, within individual, the variability was not great. It's still predictable within the predictable range. So the melamine intake rate was uh, about, uh, was in the range of 0.8 to 1,130 1, nanogram per kilogram body weight per day, a mean value of 63 nanogram per kilogram body weight per day. For cyanuric acid, it's much higher as because you know the cyanuric acid levels were five to 10 times higher than the submelamine. So the intake rate is much higher for cyanuric acid. And 
the US Food and Drug Administration and some of the scientific uh, studies have reported tolerable daily intake values. These are kind of recommended values, not final established values for regulatory purposes. Uh, as you can see, these 19 individuals uh, melamine exposure did not exceed the Food and Drug Administration's uh, tolerable daily intake, as well as the study from uh, other two scientific studies which have reported tolerable daily intake of the lowest value was 3,150 nanogram per milligram per kilogram body weight per day. For cyanuric acid, yes, for some of the individuals, you had values exceeding the tolerable daily intake. But again, this is for a few days, maybe they were using melamine both. I know uh, the subject number four is a 12-year-old children, child, um, so, you know, it's Asian child, sometimes if you use, you know, melamine bowls that can introduce, um, of course, melamine and cyanuric acid exposure uh, when, when melamine breaks down. So overall, the tolerable day, uh, the day, our calculated daily intake values are 10 to under 10, lower than the tolerable daily intake. Then the question is where the exposure com uh, comes from. So we analyzed 121 food samples, 24 food packaging materials, and 12 animal feed samples collected from Albany, New York in 2018. And these are the results. As you can see, meat, cereal, milk, seafood, beverages, vegetables, oil products. So they all contain melamine, uh, almost between 80 to 100% of the samples we analyzed. And cyanuric acid concentrations are higher than melamine concentrations. And you can see the chicken uh, samples, the meat samples had the highest concentrations of both melamine and cyanuric acid, especially chicken, right? Um, so the median concentrations in food ranged between 24 nanogram per gram in meat to 2.2 nanogram per gram in vegetables. The highest concentration of three, 305 nanogram per gram was found in a chicken sample. Animal feed also contained melamine. Uh, sometimes they mix uh, cyanuric acid or melamine as a non-protein nitrogen uh, uh, component therefore animal feed, you know, sometimes contain concentration. These are all median values. Uh, food packaging contained uh, melamine. It was a surprise for us, in fact. Uh, we didn't expect that, but now that we have heard from Jane that, uh, you know, these compounds are used. When we started our work in 2017, we didn't know that melamine is used in food packaging material. The highest concentration of 1,570 nanogram per gram was found in uh, pasta uh, box, actually, the, the cardboard box uh, that was meant for uh, pasta. So, you know, these chemicals are there in food packaging as well. Then we calculated the dietary intake, you know, based on the amount of food you consume, different types of food. We calculated the dietary intake values for infants, toddlers, children. Uh, teenagers and adults, you can see that uh, the exposures are much higher in toddlers uh, per melamine, 73 nanogram per kilogram body weight per day, for cyanuric acid, 347 nanogram per kilogram body weight per day. And these values are much higher than that for adults. So again, it is reflected in urine. In urine, we had, um, you know, the, the concentrations in children are five to 10 times higher than that in adults. The dietary sources also reflect the same. Uh, you know, the children have much higher exposures than adults through the consumption of different types of food. The toddlers have even much higher levels. ETSA, the European Food Safety Authority, reported dietary intake values for 17 European countries combined. Uh, it was uh, reported in 2010, so it was the time when melamine scandal was a hot topic. So they reported much higher dietary intake values for melamine and cyanuric acid. And our values are at least, uh, you know, 10 to 50 times lower than what was reported in 2010 in Europe. Looking at this data, these intake values, we can say that diet only explains 20 to 25% of the total exposure that we measured in urine samples. Okay. So that it means that there are other sources of exposure. So among diet, what are the major sources of exposure? Dairy products, meat, 
and cereal. These are the three food products that contribute to more than 80% of the total dietary intake of melamine and thymine gland. We also analyzed breast milk samples from National Children's Study Specimen Bank, 100 breast milk samples coming from different parts of the country. Um, and also we analyzed the infant formula. So infant formula collected in 2008, 2018, we see a big, de big de decline in uh, the concentrations of melamine and cyanuric acid in infant formula collected in 2018 compared to that in 2008. Breast milk samples contained much lower concentrations of melamine and cyanuric acid than what was found in infant, infant formula. 94%, more than 94% of the breast milk samples contained melamine and cyanuric acid. And cyanuric acid concentrations were higher than those of melamine concentrations in breast milk samples. And the concentrations in breast milk were two to five fold lower than those found in infant formula as well as in cow milk samples. So what did we find? If you are breastfeeding a baby, Breastfeeding does not introduce a lot of melamine, but if you are feeding the baby with the infant formula, you are exposing the baby to a much higher levels of melamine and cyanuric acid. But still, the intake, intake values calculated for breastfeeding as well as infant formula feeding is 10 to 100 times below the current tolerable daily intake value. Then we also analyzed other sources of exposure, drinking water, indoor air, indoor dust. So what did we find? Fine. So swimming pool water, you can see the concentration. Humongous, several milligrams per liter because cyanuric acid is directly dumped into swimming pool as to preserve the chlorine in, 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 in swimming pool water. Uh, so, you know, if you are swimming, people are drinking water in swimming pool, they are dosed with cyanuric acid, right? Bottled water, tap water, they all contain melamine and cyanuric acid, measurable levels, uh, you can easily measure. Even bottled water, 98 nanogram per liter, and cyanuric acid is the major compound of all, you know, the four different derivatives we analyze. Melamine is also there, but cyanuric acid is present at much higher levels in water samples uh, than, than melamine. They calculated the daily intake values, uh, through the consumption of tap water or bottled water, the, the exposure doses are much lower than the dietary exposure doses. In this particular study, we also analyzed atrazine. Many of you may know atrazine is a widely used herbicide, and it is also found in drinking water samples very widely. There is a very good correlation between atrazine, the herbicide used in agriculture, to melamine concentrations in, in uh, drinking water. We also analyzed melamine in indoor dust samples because melamine is used in a lot of indoor products. Dust samples, we all ingest dust. So dust can be a source of exposure. You can see here melamine concentrations are really high. Uh, we analyzed in fact samples from ten, uh, nine different countries. The US had the highest concentration of all the nine countries we measured the dust samples from. 12,000 nanograms per gram. So if you are ingesting dust, of course, we are all ingesting dust to some extent that can contribute to exposure. So the melamine exposure doses calculated from dust ingestion uh, is given here. Uh, in, in dust sample, melamine is much higher than the cyanuric acid. And uh, you know it, it's not a trivial source. If you calculate the intake rate, of course, the water uh, contributes much lower than the dust in the intake. And, and for the dust, Toddlers ingest 10 times more because toddlers crawl on the floor because of the hand to mouth behavior. They are much highly exposed to melamine through dust ingestion than others. Textiles contain melamine. Um, in fact, melamine is much higher than cyanuric acid in textile samples. Concentrations of up to 81,800 81, nanograms per gram um, in some apparel, particularly the cotton fabric. You may be surprised. Sometimes you like to wear cotton and synthetic fabric, but melamine is widely used in cotton fabric and cotton clothes. It's because you know cotton fabrics are prone to uh, crease, uh, crease, so therefore it provides crease. I know I'm running out of time. Yes, I'm going to wrap this up. Yes, 
a quick time. Uh, what do you think? Basically, the summary of everything we did. What are the important sources of exposure? One thing that is very clear is that in, uh, infants and toddlers are much highly exposed than adults. Uh, swimming can be a big source of exposure in children. Dietary intake is a major source for adults. Dust is an important source for toddlers. And infant pharma is a major source for uh, the infants. So I think that basically covers almost everything. But what we have measured so far accounts only for 30% of the total exposure. There are many other sources of exposure, like melamine bowls, uh, like what Jane talked about. We have done some studies. I have not included that presentation here. With that, I would like to thank, because I know I'm kind of running up time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanan. I'm sorry to rush through this. Um, we'll be pulling up Sheila's slides shortly, Andrews, and moving on to our next presentation. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. Great. Great. Um, Thanks to the organizers for inviting us here um, to speak on this topic. Um, I am on my first work trip in two years, so I'm coming from a hotel room. So if, um, if the sound goes out or the connection becomes unsteady, please let me know. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about melamine exposure in childhood and associations with kidney outcomes. And I'm happy to be doing this presentation with Drew Day, who is a postdoctoral fellow. Um, and toxicologist and epidemiologist um, in our research group. And I think it's uh, nice to go after um, Dr. Kanan because he really laid out the, um, the background uh, for this talk. So in terms of regulations. Um, I think we heard about this from both Jane and uh, Dr. Kanan. So the FDA did a risk assessment to determine safe doses for the population, and they determined 0 0.063 milligrams per kilogram body weight. Um, and also the WHO uh, did an assessment and they took on the 0.2 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day um, exposures and determined that was safe. And that's similar to the EFSA um, concentration that uh, Jane had mentioned. So there are just some important caveats I wanna mention here um, because Dr. Kanan had referred to this doesn't still exceed uh, to tolerable daily intake and many times in the presentation. So these um, safety regulations are based primarily on animal data. They're based primarily on the endpoint of kidney stones. Um, and uh, they're, they were based on data that did not have urinary biomarkers of exposure. Um, so they had to create these when the Chinese um, scandal came out um, of contamination. And at that time, they didn't have the luxury of hum knowing what the human exposures were with biomarkers. Um, they had to determine this based on estimated intakes. Um, so there was little human data used or available at that time. And we often see these with tolerable daily intakes that they're not based on um, human data from, but they don't get revised once human data um, is available. So um, in terms of kidney function, these are a number of biomarkers of kidney function. And I, I'm not going to go through all of these <laughs> in this presentation, um, but I wanted to share them with you because we'll be referring to them in our talk. And this will also be posted so you can always go back and look. But the kidney is a very complex organ and the nephron specifically is a very complex um, cell that has many functions. So in terms of major kidney biomarkers, biologically creatinine, albumin, and total protein are looked at. Um, and this is complicated because when you're trying to adjust for urinary dilution, sometimes you use urinary creatinine, but it can also be a marker of kidney function um, as is albumin and total protein. If these things are found in the urine, it means the kidney is spilling protein and really you wanna be absorbing that protein to use um, for energy and other functions. Then there's a number of more novel uh, factors like uh, the kidney injury molecule one, NAG, um, NGAL, epidermal growth factor, uh, fatty acid binding protein three, um, 
that are related to specific parts of the nephron and functions, whether it's the proximal uh, or the distal tubule cells. And then we also sometimes look at the urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. Um, so you'll be seeing all of these terms. And I just wanted to make sure that you had a little bit of background on it. So in terms of exposure, ambient exposure, um, and health impacts, there are recent data that suggest that melamine is associated with increased biomarkers of inflammation and immunity. And here, what they're doing are experiments where they're exposing, um, in, in vitro experiments, where they're exposing cells to melamine. Um, so it's the white is no melamine and black is melamine. And these graphs on the left are hours after exposure and the graphs on the right are with increasing doses of exposure. And on the y-axis are biomarkers of inflammation and immunity. And without going through each of these individually, you can see that with higher doses of melamine um, exposure, you do have increases in inflammation and immunity. Um, and with the longer period of exposure, you also see increases in expression of these factors. So in terms of melamine exposure and kidney health, this will be the focus of our talk today, but there's, we think melamine is an endocrine disrupting chemical, so it may affect many health outcomes, but we are focusing on kidney health given that that was what was seen with contamination uh, many years ago, and it's been the focus of our research for the past few years. So this is, um, these are just correlations of melamine exposure on the Y axis, and then biomarkers of renal injury on I'm sorry, melamine on the x-axis and then biomarkers of renal in injury on the y-axis. And on the left is the albumin to creatinine ratio. And on the right um, is a NAG. Um, and you can see here that as melamine increases, you do see an increase in ACR and NAG. And this isn't very strong evidence, but this was some of the first evidence um, in humans to show that there may be relationships between background melamine exposure and kidney health, and so not necessarily those high dose exposures that you saw in the contamination event. In terms of melamine exposure and frank kidney disease, um, this study was done by Sai et al., and this was in adults with chronic kidney disease. And so they looked at different tertiles of melamine exposure, um, and as those tertiles increased, you saw a doubling of creatinine, a, a increased slope in terms of the doubling of creatinine for an increase from tertile one to three. And so this was a very significant finding because these patients already had underlying chronic kidney disease, and it really um, supports the idea that melamine is increasing their likelihood of going to frank renal failure um, with increasing exposure. And so based on all of this, we decided to do a pilot study um, of kids because we wanted to determine if kids were really exposed. Like I said before, we didn't have a lot of biomarkers of, hu of human exposure. So this was focused on very young children um, and to see whether they were exposed and whether they might have um, those exposures might have associations with kidney outcomes. And so this was a pilot study, a convenient sample from two cohorts where we had urine left over. Um, the two cohorts in Washington State um, were Bright Start and Peeps, and the, then starting early was from New York. Um, and we had about 109 samples um, that we looked at. You can see here that in terms of parental education, about 40% of uh, parents had less than a high school education. We had equal numbers of males and females, about equal numbers there. And these kids were very young. We had infants up to about four to five years of age. Uh, and then we also looked at the number of urinary um, outcomes. So first, we did find that kids were exposed. So the limit of detection, uh, the percentage above the limit of detection was 80%. So 80% of kids in this um, convenient sample had detectable melamine and 95% had detectable cyanuric acid. Um, and as 
Dr. Kanan pointed out before, these concentrations were actually much higher um, than, what, than what we see in adults. Um, we also looked at some urinary biomarkers of function, um, KIM-1, FAPP3, NGAL, and urea. We looked to see what predicted these melamine and cyanuric, uh, cyanuric acid concentrations. And uh, similar to what Dr. Kanan said, we didn't see that many of these factors predicted these concentrations. Age did predict um, both of these in a univariate model, but when you added all factors in together, we did not see any significant relationships with any of these um, demographic predictors. Uh, when, then we also wanted to look at how they were related to kidney biomarkers. Um, and in this uh, table here, what we see is that um, for a tenfold increase in melamine concentration, we saw increases in FABP3, NGAL, and urea. Um, and for an inc tenfold increase in cyanuric acid concentration, we also saw a suggestion of an um, increase in KIM-1. Um, and this was a study, this pilot study that we did. Um, and based on this work, we then uh, obtained funding to look at two cohorts uh, within Washington state, a rural cohort and an urban cohort. And we wanted to look at the rural cohort because they may be more exposed to pesticides and pesticides is one of the potential contributors to melamine concentrations. And so with that, I'll have uh, Drew um, start doing the rest of this talk. Thank you, Sheila. Um, yeah, so for this section of the talk, I wanna talk about the GAP study, which is a study of an urban site and a rural site um, and age four to five year old children. Um, so in this study, we're trying to relate melamine and the analogs, amylene, amylide, and cyanuric acid to uh, biomarkers of kidney injury. Um, and this involved the uh, city of Seattle and 163 children from that site and the rural uh, smaller town of Yakima with 181 children. Um, so just comparing the exposure results between the pilot study that Sheila just covered and the GAP study, you can see that the melamine was quite a bit lower in uh, the GAP study. Um, you know, a mean of around 28 for the pilot study versus around six nanograms per mil in uh, the GAP study. Um, although we did have a greater percentage of uh, detection for the uh, GAP study. And um, for, in terms of uh, cyanuric acid, uh, the mean was higher for GAPs, but the median was lower. And that's because there were some very high values for cyanuric acid within the GAP study. Um, amylene and amylide were only measured in GAPs, not in the pilot study. Amylene was almost entirely below the detection limit, so we excluded it from further analysis. And amylide was lower than cyanuric acid or melamine. So now going to the demographic variables, what are the differences between the urban and rural site in this cohort? Uh, so the dilution, that urinary specific gravity was similar, um, but the Yakima cohort was slightly older by uh, around 0.3 years. Uh, the Yakima cohort had a higher BMI, uh, average BMI Z-score across the children by, um, with a mean that was almost double that of Seattle. Um, and then the urine hour of collection was around an hour and a half to two hours later in Yakima than Seattle. Um, so there may be, you know, some influence of hour of collection that we controlled for. Uh, and in terms of uh, categorical demographic variables, the sex ratio was similar between Seattle and Yakima, um, but all these other uh, variables were different. So there were more non-white participants in Seattle It's a, a versus Yakima. There's about 30% in Seattle versus around 20% in Yakima. Um, there were more Hispanic participants in Yakima, around 25% versus 11% in Seattle. And then the uh, income and educational attainment was higher in Seattle than Yakima. Um, please go forward. Um, so now I just want to get to the results of the linear regression analysis, and uh, these are forest plots, so the dot is the linear coefficient relating the exposure, be it melamine uh, in the blue, amylide in the green, or cyanuric acid, uh, which I abbreviate here CA in the red, um, to uh, some amount of increase or decrease in the biomarkers. And uh, I just want to point out real quickly, EGF uh, at the far right there uh, of these eight biomarkers uh, is different from the other ones in that an increase is a beneficial change as opposed to an adverse change, whereas with all the other ones, uh, an increase is, is an adverse thing, it's bad. Um, so what we saw here was not many significant results. Um, 
but you can see with the asterisk there, uh, for cyanuric acid, we saw what seemed to be protective associations between cyanuric acid and total protein and NAG, and then also a protective association uh, between melamine and EGF, because once again, EGF is different in that and increases a beneficial change. Um, now, one other thing that we wanted to look at was potentially interactions between these compounds, because from the toxicologic uh, literature and these rodent studies, when you co-expose melamine and cyanuric acid, they can complex to form crystals, which form kidney stones, which damage the renal tubule. Uh, so we wanted to look to see, do we see that synergism uh, or interactions between these exposures? And sort of contrary to what we expected, um, we saw some, what appeared to be antagonism between um, melamine and cyanuric acid, which you see in the blue there, and these are the interaction term coefficients. So they're the amount that the relationship between melamine and the outcome changes given uh, you know, an increase in either amylide or cyanuric acid. So for the cyanuric acid, there seemed to be some antagonism, once again, with that protein in NAG, where we saw the uh, protective effects with cyanuric acid in the total sample uh, above. But for the, in the orange, uh, there seemed to be some sort of synergism between melamine and amylide that we see with protein, Kim1, and NAG, um, and then potentially in EGF as well in, in the other direction. Um, so I wanted to get down to like, okay, what were the side-by-side -side differences? We just talked about the total GAPS population, but um, now we want to distinguish between what's going on in urban site versus the rural site. So I'm just, uh, uh, this plot here is just box plots comparing the levels of the three exposures, melamine, amylide, and cyanuric acid to the left of that blue line, and then the eight out, uh, biomarker outcomes to the right of that blue line. So you can see that the melamine uh, exposures are similar between the sites, but both amylide and cyanuric acid were significantly higher in Yakima. Um, and the creatinine was as well, but counterintuitively, despite that higher exposure to amylene and cyanuric acid, Yakima had lower levels of albumin, the urinary albumin creatinine ratio, total protein, Kim1, and NAC. Um, and then when we wanted to look at an interaction between um, each of these exposures and their association with the outcomes by site, uh, which is to say, what's the difference between the Seattle participants and the, and the Yakima participants um, in terms of the relationship between the exposure and outcome, um, we saw that those former protective associations that we observed appear to be specific to Yakima. So you see that there with the protein, the cyanuric acid, uh, there's a significant interaction, uh, sort of negative coefficient for protein and, and also NAG. Uh, that EGF, melamine association, appears to be close to significant, although the interaction term wasn't quite significant. Um, so that shows us that there's, there's something unique going on in this rural site where um, there are these apparent counterintuitive protective associations. Um, so please go on to the conclusions. Um, so as Sheila stated with the pilot study, uh, there were two urban sites. There was a higher melamine exposure uh, and also younger children with a mean age of around uh, two and a half years old versus our four to five year olds in GAPS. Um, and in that study, there were uh, observed adverse associations between the melamine analogs and the kidney injury biomarkers. But the story was much more complicated in GAPS where there's a lower melamine exposure and slightly older children, um, where we seem to see these sort of rural site specific protective effects of melamine and cyanuric acid, um, an adverse synergism of some sort between melamine and amylide, uh, and, a, and a sort of antagonism or protective um, uh, interaction between melamine and cyanuric acid. And this difference of findings might be related to the age uh, um, of these the age difference between the cohorts because there could be different susceptible or, or vulnerable windows. Uh, the sample size, the gap study is, is continuing to collect samples is still ongoing, um, differences in, in the exposure. Um, and it could be that we also didn't uh, capture the real vulnerable time point of melamine exposure. Maybe that's prenatal or earlier in life. Um, and so the original data from the epidemiological literature and from much of the toxicologic literature is just focused on melamine and not on amylene, amylene, and cyanuric acid. So we're still really learning about the effects of these melamine analogs and how they interact with each other. Um, and so more research is needed um, to, to clarify all these questions. And uh, yeah, I just want to uh, acknowledge the uh, Echo Center grant and the, uh, the pathway study that, um, and all the study participants and our funding uh, to, to help out with these, the pilot study and the GAP study.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to go over just a little bit to get to some of the um, Q&A from the audience. Um, we're going to start off with some questions on health effects. Um, what is the suspected hormonal action of melanin, or is there any? I can probably answer. Um, you know, I have read a lot of literature on melamine, but there is no one single study that focused on melamine exposure in relation to hormonal perturbation. So there is no you know, concrete study to show that melamine you know, can affect a certain hormone. Um, we don't have that kind of information yet. OK. Um, and another person asked if there were adverse effects on the immune system. Are you aware of any research on that? So some of those um, immune factors um, that I um, mentioned previously, there was a question in the chat and it was a great, great question about clarification. So they were associated with increased inflammation and poorer immune function. Um, so it wasn't that there's increased immunity with increased melamine exposure, but more poor immune function. And yes, that has been looked at, um, but only at the, as far as I know, at the in vitro level. Mm, got it. So um, Sheila, before you have to go, in your opinion, you know, as a healthcare provider for children, what are research priorities um, in regards to melamine and cyanuric acid and um, health effects? Yeah, I mean, I think that what we know um, from the data so far is that with high dose exposures, we will expect to see significant kidney impacts. Um, and we saw that from the contamination event. But what is to, what's there to note is that we saw it in infants who were primarily exposed to formula um, and it was contamination in that formula. And what we see in our own studies is that infants have the highest concentrations of these exposures and older children and adults um, do not. And so they may not be as susceptible. And the one exception to that is adults or children with chronic kidney disease may be a highly susceptible group um, because they already have underlying kidney disease. So then when you add on uh, even an ambient level um, kidney nephrotoxicant, you may see potential health impacts. Uh, so that's from the kidney um, realm. I think for other potential health impacts, um, there is a review paper that summarizes melamine as an endocrine disrupting chemical, but there's been very, very few studies that have looked at other outcomes besides um, renal toxicity or kidney toxicity. So there's a lot more um, to be done in that realm. And I think the other big research gap is learning more about melamine and its analogs. In that original contamination event, um, you know, I mentioned that they didn't look at biomarkers of exposure, and we made a lot of assumptions about melamine and cyanuric acid, but there may actually be um, toxicity, significant toxicity with the analogs, um, which is what some of our preliminary gaps data has alluded to. And I didn't say it at the beginning, but I should have that our that gaps data is very preliminary. It's ongoing. It's unpublished, um, and it could change in the future as we get more participants. Since the pandemic has slowed down our <laughs> recruitment. Um, great, thank you. Um, so we have quite a few questions about exposures. Um, do you have any information about occupational exposure to melamine, um, either through production of melamine and then um, uh, and, uh, farm workers was another thing that came up since you mentioned pesticides. Yeah, so there are a lot of studies from Taiwan. Um, uh, they have published a lot of papers uh, because, of course, they produce melamine. Um, and they have reported even uh, human biomonitoring data in occupationally exposed melamine you know, production bowl production workers. The concentrations are, of course, 10 to 100 times higher than what we have found in the general population. In fact, I have re I reviewed a paper very recently, two three weeks ago, uh, 
uh, they have reported even in sweat um, from the people from melamine factory, they have found melamine. So when people, you know, the perspiration sweat can, can contain melamine in that group, the urine concentrations were like, you know, several thousand nanograms per milliliter. And what we have found in our general population is between 10 to 100 nanograms per milliliter. Okay, great. Dr. Monk, um, someone asked, um, you mentioned metal cans were um, coated with melamine. Um, is this the interior of the cans and is this used in um, replacement of BPA? Um, no, as far as I know, not. I think it's a layer under the epoxy coating. So the epoxy coating is the BPA <clears throat> coating. And in order to apply that to the metal, there's a, a coating with melamine formaldehyde resin directly on the metal. And, and so if you get migration, basically it means the melamine goes through the epoxy coating. We have a dossier on can coatings on our website. I'm just uh, trying to pull up the link. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned um, that melamine is... Um, used in sponges. Um, and I think that, you know, at least in the United States, the, the magic eraser sponges are, are, are that. Um, are, there, are there studies on, you know, that being a source of exposure? And, you know, perhaps is that, you know, related to the dust, indoor dust that you talked about, Dr. Kanan? Oh, you're on mute, Dr. Kanan. Yeah, I mean, those products can contribute to, uh, you know, the indoor, indoor air concentrations or dust concentrations because there is some level of degassing, right? So, you know, they, they can release melamine from, from such products like sponges and, you know, the erase, erase board uh, erasers and all that. Okay. Maybe just to clarify, the, these are not the sponges you use for dishwashing. So th these are sponges that basically dissolve when you get them wet. So it, it's not because there was a question also uh, uh, whether it was okay to put them in the microwave. I don't think that those are the, the sponges. Those are usually made from different plastic dishwashing mm -hmm. sponges. And, um, you know, some, we had somebody ask about uh, they're in Nigeria and they have, uh, every family has plates made of melamine. Um, and which made me think of the question, um, what do we know about global exposures and differences um, around the world? Not much is known, you know, it, it requires, a, 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 you know, a global level monitoring of, you know, different populations. Um, so that, that's not well known, at least to my knowledge. But I would expect much higher exposure in the Asian population because you know I, I, I go to China, Korea, Japan uh, a lot, and I know they use a lot of melamine products. But you know studies have not been done to look at melamine exposure in the pop those populations. Okay, um, so we have a, some questions about you know regulatory action and also prevention. Um, what are some safer substitutes that could be used in place of melamine? I mean, it's used in so many areas, so maybe I'll ask specifically about um, foodware. Yeah, so uh, I think if, if you're looking at repeat use foodware, uh, the best options always are the more inert materials, uh, stainless steel, notably, or then glass and ceramics. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what used to be used before plastics took over. And th those actually are, are safer options because there's less migration. Um, and then I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was also curious to, to hear about the use in textiles. Um, there's actually this um, ZDHC uh, list, uh, restricted substances list that some textile uh, companies um, use and melamine is not on that list. I just saw that. So I think that that may be um, a next update to put melamine on the textiles list. Okay, and what are some, um, following up on that, what are some, you know, other than the stainless steel glass um, ceramic, what are some other prevention strategies that parents can follow to limit melamine exposure for their children? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go in just a second, but I just wanted to emphasize that although we know about sources of melamine exposure, we, we've learned this lesson again and again in um, pediatric environmental health, that although we know about sources of exposure, we don't have a lot of good intervention data to show that doing the um, actions that we've been talking about will definitely reduce your melamine exposure. And, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news in that sense, but, and I think it's good to have knowledge and to know about sources of exposure and to use stainless steel and glass for a variety of reasons, not just melamine, but for so many other health impacts. Um, but we don't have good intervention data to show that it will reduce exposures. And that is a research gap um, and, and would be a simple study um, you know, to do if people wanted to take that on. But I just wanted to thank the organizers. I have to hop off. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we had a couple more questions about um, regulatory action. Um, does the TDI that you referred to, um, that both of you referred to, vary for children, pregnant women, um, and focus on health outcomes that are important in those sensitive periods of development? Not really, uh, Karen. Um, the TDA values are recommended values, not really regulatory values. It has not come to that level yet, at least to my knowledge. Um, you know, the melamine was considered safe for a long period of time. Uh, that's why even the TDA values were like, you know, several hundreds of milligram per gram. Uh, the, lethal toxic, the lethal dose is much, much, much higher, which means that they are relatively less toxic. That's why, you know, they were used in many products including you know, the kitchenware, dinnerware, all kinds of things. But with the chronic exposure, as more and more data are accumulated about the toxicity, the TDA values are expected to go down. And that's what is happening you know, from in the last 10 years. That's what we are seeing. The TDA values are continuing to go down. And now you know, in, in Europe, uh, it is almost now being classified as a probable carcinogen or suspect carcinogen, something. So it's, you know, the, the interest in melamine research is kind of, again, going up with a lot of you know, data related to chronic exposure and, and the, the, the reference values are kind of getting lowered all the time. I don't know, Jane may have more. No, I, I completely agree. And it kind of also shows a little bit that the way that we approach chemical regulation is not ideal because we shouldn't have to find out these effects when a chemical is already allowed on the market and especially not when it's a high production volume chemical that is persistent in the environment. That's what concerns me the most that, I mean, we're, we're producing this chemical, uh, it's getting out there into the environment, it's accumulating and, and we, at the same time, we're seeing that the you know, chronic exposure effects are probably much more severe than anticipated previously. So I do think that there needs to actually be urgent regulatory action to stop the exposure, because as Sheila said, it can't be up to doctors and environmental health experts to recommend how to avoid these chemicals. That, that's, that's a job that our regulators should be doing. Yeah. And yeah, I think that even, you know, as you mentioned, there, there, are, there just aren't that many studies. So we are so happy to have you guys here today to talk about, you know, the urgent need for more knowledge on this. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you so much um, for this great presentation, these great presentations. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Chase's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next CHE EDC partnership webinar will take place October 26th and is on the global cancer risk from unregulated polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Details will be posted shortly on our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you were new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE Partnerships webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. <laughs>
With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Jane Kanan, Sheila, who's gone now, and Drew, for all of your great work and presenting today. Thank you so much too, to you, Karen, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Stay well and healthy and have a great day.